Hey, Shep here at Iron Anchor Cycles, and we're back with a new video. And I know it's been a pretty significant amount of time since our last one, but uh, we've been pretty busy with a lot of customer work. And frankly, a lot of what we've been doing is things we've already covered in YouTube videos. So it didn't feel like it would be super, super uh, useful or helpful to anybody to keep going over the same things. So we've been doing a lot of cam chests, a lot of motor builds, we've been tuning, we've been doing a lot of other things, uh, a lot of Olin's, in, uh, Olin's suspension installs um, and a lot of handlebars. And those last two topics are actually what bring us to this bike today. So what we did on this bike is a little different than the most common things we typically do. So figured it would be a great opportunity to come back with a new video and show you guys hopefully something that maybe isn't super well covered uh, out there on the internet already. So hopefully what you can see what we've got in front of me is a Batwing fairing bike with a T-bar setup on it. So this is not a super, super common thing because in a lot of cases, uh, people want to avoid the T-bar on a Batwing bike because they're afraid of blocking their infotainment. And truth be told, you really will block your infotainment if you put something like this on your bike. However, in the case of Harley's Electroglide Standard, uh, this is a 21 model, uh, but it's been out for a couple of years, so definitely a gettable bike. Um, there is no infotainment, so you really don't run any uh, risk of losing any functionality by running a T-bar setup. And obviously what you do get is the tremendous handling uh, and, and rider control benefits of putting this type of a setup onto your bagger. So what we're gonna do in this video is talk a little bit about what we did here and show you, go back in time and show you kind of the install. Um, the other thing in addition to the T-bar setup we did was at the same time we had the bike apart, uh, we went ahead, and went ahead and did uh, Olin's uh, Nix 22 cartridges in the front end of this bike. So that's gonna pair really nicely with the Olin's rear shocks that we already did on the bike for the customer a few months back. So this bike is definitely definitely set up really, really nicely to be a great, great rider. Uh, we've got some more work planned for the customer on this uh, in terms of engine upgrades to get some more power. Uh, we're just waiting on some parts to come in and we'll get the bike back and do that when the time comes. Uh, but for now, what I wanna do is talk a little bit about this setup. So. What we've got here is, as I mentioned, it's a Krauss riser, uh, or maybe I didn't mention that. Um, but this whole setup comes from Krauss, and it's a pretty common, pretty popular thing these days, and there's a lot of reasons for that. They're tremendously functional, they're exceptionally well made, and they look really great as well. So on this particular bike, what we have is their 10 inch kickback riser. So the kickback refers to the bend in the riser right here. Hopefully that's clear on the camera. Um, and the 10 inches obviously would be from the bottom of the riser up to where the bar mounts. So in addition to that, in order to run a, t uh, a riser like this on a street glide, you're gonna need to run a pullback plate. And in this case, we've got Krause's T-Rex pullback plate, which adds two and a half inches of pullback. And I wanna say roughly, Mm, maybe a half inch or an inch of additional height. Uh, in addition to that, we've got a Flymoto bar here, which is roughly another two and a half inches of pullback and three inches of height. So overall in total with uh, a 10 inch riser, three inches of rise or two and a half inches of rise in the bar, no, three, and a half, three inches of rise in the bar, uh, plus an inch at the bottom, you're looking at roughly 14 inches for the total height of this bar. And that should make sense because where these hand grips are sitting is roughly in a similar uh, height position to where you'd see on like a, a ape hanger kind of bar that was more common on a Batwing bike. So uh, the difference obviously is gonna be in the way the bars are mounted. The T-bar is gonna give you a much, much more firm control over the bike, particularly with Krause's setup where it's hard mounted at the bottom and you have isolators inside the clamping area. Uh, additionally, you've got a lot more pullback on this bar than what you can get out of just an ape hanger. You know, if you have an ape hanger bar, you can't move it back without a pullback plate because the riser is where it is. And in order to get, you know, the pullback, you're gonna need to get a bar that's really got a big kind of curve to it, or maybe it's in the hand position, which isn't good, uh, or you're pulling the bars back, which isn't good. And you wind up uh, with some really bad geometry when you start doing that. And the bike becomes very, very difficult to steer uh, on some of those larger uh, T-bars, you'll actually be kind of fighting the natural uh, movement of the bike in order to get it to turn. Really, really bad stuff. This is the kind of setup you wanna run uh, if you wanna get more control over the front end of the bike. So that's the riser, that's the bar, the pullback plate. Uh, the other thing we did here I mentioned is the Olin's cartridges and you can actually see that really well right here because uh, there's a valence plate, and we'll show you that in the install process, that doesn't go back on, that accommodates our kickback plate. 
Uh, the other thing you may notice is that the ignition switch has been removed from the bike. That's another thing that's necessary in order to do this. Um, it's a very, very simple uh, switch to delete from the bike. You're not cutting wires or playing anything like that. It's all controlled by the BCM in the bike. Go in, make a, do a flash change, update on that BCM, and all the power of the bike is just controlled by the switch here. So more details on that later in the video. I will show you, uh, you know, what's involved there. Um, but I think what I'll do now is just we'll get started um, and go ahead and rewind back in time for you and show us uh, putting this in. A quick call out, I might have made it uh, later in the video, but this isn't really a total how-to step-by-step install. Uh, this is really just more about showing you how these parts work and how they go on. Uh, it's a very easy install. Get yourself a service manual. Um, if you know how to take your fairing off and get in there, uh, all you gotta do is look up some torque specs and it'll be good to go. So we'll do some more how-to videos down the road, um, but in this particular case, this is really just a, a highlight on a really, really great product and showing you how it fits and functions on a bike like this. So I'll just uh, I'll get on the bike here just so you can see a little bit better, give you another angle. Um, yeah, it's pretty good. Um, hopefully you can see this really gives you a great, great riding position. So uh, the bars are pulled back nicely, a good bend in my elbows. Uh, they're not too low, not too high. This is gonna ride super, super well uh, for the customer. So he's gonna be pretty jazzed about it, I think. So without anything further, uh, we'll get going and uh, we'll show you how we did this. All right, we're just about ready to get started with the install on this bike. And while the first step in most cases would normally be to start doing the teardown and kind of get everything out of the way that we need to move in order to get to the things we need to get to, there is gonna be one step we're gonna do on this bike before we do any of that. So we haven't touched a single thing. Everything is still together. Uh, wiring, battery, everything's all good. And I mention that because what we're gonna deal with on this is a little bit different than a lot of bar installs. And that involves having to eliminate the ignition switch on this bike. So if you've watched any of these installs uh, and you've seen you know, T-bars going on baggers, um, there are varying degrees of things that you uh, will lose functionality with, or in this case, need to lose the ignition switch entirely when you're doing this type of bar. So on a road glide, for example, uh, you know, sometimes the T-bars will kind of go around the ignition switch using a different kind of pullback plate and you might, you know, get, get two functions out of it off an ignition, but you'll lose accessory and fork lock. In other cases, say with like a Lucky Dave's bar, they're set a little wider so you actually maintain the full switch. In the case of the Batwing bike using the T-Rex pullback plate, you do need to eliminate the ignition switch entirely. So. Uh, what we need to do in order to do that is do a quick flash on uh, the bike, on the BCM, in order to disable the functionality of this. So, uh, you know, if you're familiar with wiring on Harleys, Harley switched to CAN bus wiring uh, several years ago, and a lot of people, you know, maybe don't totally understand it or don't like it. I personally think it's one of the greatest technological uh, changes that Harley has made because instead of having these huge complicated wiring harnesses interconnecting all kinds of different things with all these different functions, uh, the CAN bus computer controlled wiring essentially just allows all the components to be plugged back into the main wiring harness and with different pulses of voltage traveling through that four wire system, uh, the switch or the, the light or whatever the component is basically just does whatever the computer tells it to. So in the case of this ignition switch, it's not like an old uh, you know, older bike where the main power, you know, to the ignition circuit and accessory circuit and lighting circuit is all running through this switch. It's not the case on these bikes. It's literally just a small plug that runs back to the ECU. So you can, if you have the, the uh, Harley digital tech, like a dealership would have, uh, or the software that we have, uh, you can go into the bike and you can enable and disable all kinds of functions and features, namely, in this case, eliminating this switch. So, there's a bit of a long-winded way of saying, we're gonna do this now, number one, to make sure that it works and we get the bike able to power up without the switch being on and everything is fine, uh, just in case there's any kind of technological glitch there. But number two, we wanna make sure that we can do it with all the wiring connected. So if we wait until we get the uh, pullback plate installed, the ignition switch won't be there, which means the fairing won't be back on, which means we won't necessarily be able to power the bike up because all the wiring is gonna be disconnected. So we wanna do this first to make sure that it's done so that we can put everything back together at the end. So I'm gonna grab my laptop, I'm gonna take care of that flash, and then we will uh, check in and see what that looks like, and then we'll get going with the teardown on this. All right, so just got done with the flash on the BCM. Basically we go on a laptop, we disable uh, the ignition switch, 
So the bike's obviously on right now. The ignition switch is turned on. So we'll turn this off and bike stays on. So the switch no longer has any functionality and all the power to the bike is just controlled through uh, the switch on the handlebar. So switch on off does nothing and with it off, it'll just fire up. So that's what we were trying to do. And that is going to allow us to run the components that we're putting on the bike. So we'll see all that come to fruition later and understand why this can't be here. But that was a step that we just wanted to do, like I said, while all the wiring and everything was still connected so we could get this done with no codes and not having to sort of plug everything together without everything being hooked up properly. So our next step from here is we're gonna go ahead and start the disassembly on this. All right, so we've got most of the fairing and related components disassembled, and we've got all of our accessories, switches, uh, levers, all that stuff off the bars, pretty much ready to take this off. Uh, I did want to stop here just to kind of show you where we're at. Uh, on this particular bike, because of what we're doing, changing out the risers, you do need to go this far, and the triple tree, top triple tree, does need to come off. Uh, but I've said this in other videos, I do recommend any time on a bowing bike that you're doing anything related to the bars or anything like this, um, just take the fairing off. It takes about an extra 30 seconds to disconnect the wiring and pull the fairing off, as opposed to doing the factory service manual procedure of leaving the wires connected and just sort of picking the fairing up and then tilting it forwards. Um, it can fall, it can break your fairing, it can break the front fender. Uh, it's a whole lot of risk for really nothing. Just take it off and you'll have easy access to everything. Uh, but like I said, we had to do it anyway in this case. So, um, what I wanted to show you here obviously was, you know, kind of everything taken off and this is all now ready to come off as an assembly. So what we're obviously trying to do here is we're gonna be reusing this top triple tree. Uh, we're not gonna be using the risers, the bars, and then this is the ignition switch here, which is obviously gonna come off also. Um, a little tip, uh, don't take the bars off. Don't disconnect the riser clamp, take it all off as an assembly. Um, when you go to take the bolts out of the bottom uh, for each of these little mini risers, they're gonna wanna spin around uh, unless the bar is holding them together and holding them in place. So that just makes it easier. So this is loosened up. I'm gonna go ahead and pull this off. So this is just gonna slide off the fork stem and your two uh, fork tubes, and it's all gonna come off together like this. So obviously this is our uh, throttle by wire control that's running through the bar. Uh, OEM Harley Batwing bikes, typically the wires run on the outside of the bars. Uh, so the switch housings and all that just come right off. So um, on these bikes, different than like a Dyna or a Softail or something like that, uh, or a Sports, really anything other than uh, one of these FLHs, you have to take this top triple tree off in order to get to your riser bolts. So. That's why that all has to come out so that you can take this apart. Uh, the other thing you'll see here, and hopefully this is, I'll move a little closer, so you can see why it's so clear that your ignition switch is gonna have to go. Um, if you think about you know, the riser mounting points here, with the Krauss T-Rex pullback plate, it's gonna pull everything back so that the bars will clear the fairing, obviously, but it's gonna put your bars and that plate is gonna go right where this ignition switch is. So the ignition switch, we'll get uh, unscrewed from the triple tree and we'll just put it aside. We'll save it obviously for the customer for if he wants to use it down the road for something, um, we'll just get that out of the way. So that'll all get bolted back together minus the ignition switch and we'll get this back on the bike. Uh, additionally, um, I mentioned this isn't just a bar project for us. We're also doing uh, the Olin's Nix 22 cartridges in this bike as well. Uh, we'll do the bars first and we'll get the top clamp put back in place using the fork tubes in their original locations as a guide. And once this is all back in and held together, we'll go down and we'll do the fork tubes. Um, you absolutely do not need to remove the fairing in order to do the forks on one of these bikes. Uh, you can get to you know, these bolts and get it undone without taking the fairing completely off. But given that we had to take the fairing off anyway to do the bars, it just makes life a whole lot more simple to do the forks while it's all apart. So we're gonna do it all in one shot. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over to the bench and I'm gonna start to take this apart and start to get our new parts put together. And uh, we'll see that as it comes together and we'll get it on the bike. All right, so here's our new Krauss riser along with the T-Rex pullback plate attached to the original triple tree. So this is all really straightforward. Everything just bolts together using the aluminum bushings that Krauss provides. And if you haven't, uh, not that familiar with Krauss's products or you haven't seen any of uh, our earlier videos, 
Um, really, really cool and interesting technology that goes into these. So you have solid mounts from the riser to your triple tree uh, with or without a pullback plate. But up in the top of the riser, there actually are polyurethane bushings similar or identical to what you would normally use down in uh, where the riser mounts to your tree. So what that does for you is it gives you a really, really solid connection between the riser, ultimately your handlebars, and the front end, but you still do get some vibration dampening. It's just way up at the top, so you're not getting any leverage uh, to start bending the bars around. These are rock solid. So I'll move a little closer here just so you get a better look. Um, so basically on the bike, it would be facing you like that. Um, and this Krauss plate right here is right where the ignition switch used to be, if you can picture that. Um, and this is all gonna attach. So in here, you can actually see where those bushings are up in the top where the handlebar clamp is. And as always, I'll point out, um, one of the great other features of the Krauss riser is that the entire thing is modular. So your top section is, mod is one piece, the kickback section is one piece, and then your lower legs are one piece. So any of this can be changed. So in this particular case, we've got a one and one eighth inch clamping area for a moto style bar. You can swap that for a one inch if you want. Uh, if you decide you don't want the kickback and you rather just have a straight riser, you can delete this segment altogether. And then the legs can be had in a whole bunch of different lengths. So if you're not happy with the height you've got, rather than having to buy a whole new setup, you can just change the legs, which is really cool. Um, so this piece as an assembly is gonna go right back on the bike where we originally took uh, the triple tree off from. So that will simply slide on there. And that's how that's gonna sit. So right now, I think this uh, is pretty much where we're gonna leave it. We're gonna go ahead and work a little bit on the bars. Um, not a lot to do there, basically just attaching the wiring and pulling them through. Just a short little run, so super easy. So we'll get the wiring done in the bars and then we'll go ahead and bring that stuff over. We'll get it fitted up and we'll get our wiring run and we'll see how all this is gonna to start to look. So stick around and we'll be right back. So you can see we've got our bars attached now. Went ahead and ran the wiring through, comes down through the middle of the risers here. Got our levers and master cylinder and clutch perch back on, switches, grips, mirrors. Everything's all together up here. Uh, everything looks super clean. Wires run down really nicely. They'll just kind of hide behind the risers and then slip in under the fairing once that's back on. Um, really good riding position uh, with these bars. I mean, it's pretty common. I think folks have seen T-bars on road glides a lot. Less common on the Batwing bikes because you really do block the you know, infotainment on a street glide or uh, an ultra. However, on this Electroglide standard with no infotainment, you're really not blocking anything except that little empty cubby. So pretty good compromise. Uh, in this particular case, you know, I think a lot of people sometimes will do a uh, straight riser on the street glide instead of the kickback, uh, just cause it does start to get pretty close and kind of over the tank here, but it's gonna work. There's no clearance issues, anything like that. And definitely gives you that, you know, kind of really nice tight riding position to get a lot of leverage over the front end. So I think it's gonna work out really well. Um, from here, basically what we've got to do is just neaten up uh, the lines, just make sure that we're not going to have any binding or anything like that. And we will test fit the fairing just to make sure that everything is good. Uh, but like I said, since we are installing Olin's cartridges into the front end here, we're going to do that with the fairing off just because it makes it a little bit easier. Uh, but like I said, from here, um, we're going to test fit and see how everything looks. And All right. So. There it is with the fairing test fit in place. Uh, as you can see, I actually think that this is really working out really nicely in terms of that kickback and the height. Uh, really frames the gauges nice. Uh, the bars fall right below that and you definitely still have access to that little cubby. Uh, it's hard to see maybe with the camera, but because this is on a kickback, you can just reach your hand right in over the top and you still have the full use of that, which is kind of cool. Uh, certainly, if there was an infotainment there, it would be blocking it. Um, no question about that, but obviously nothing to worry about on this particular bike. So this is just mocked up in place, um, but the bars are for the most part finished. Uh, so from here, what we're gonna do is just continue on and we're gonna do our uh, fork legs and get that going. So uh, because we've got other videos on doing Olin's cartridges, uh, we're not gonna show the actual uh, you know, fork leg removal and all that other stuff. We've got an actual how-to video actually on that, on, on how to do the Olin's cartridges. So 
We're gonna go ahead and just get the front end taken apart. We'll do the cartridge install and we'll come back when we're ready to button everything up so we can uh, show you all the final product. Um, and a couple little benefits, uh, sort of side benefits, I guess I would say, to what's gonna be going on uh, with this riser setup that I'll show you down here on the lower part of the fairing. So stick around. All right, so as you can see, uh, we've got our fairing back on and we've got our cartridges uh, installed into our fork legs. So it might be a little bit hard for you to see uh, the sort of Olin's caps sticking up here, um, but they're, they're there. Um, this is pretty much how this is gonna look now. So originally uh, there was a, a plastic valence that goes here uh, that kind of went around your switch housing and all that. Uh, that part won't go back on, obviously, now that you've got the Krauss pullback set up in here. So this is gonna remain open. Uh, so basically what you wanna do is just be cognizant of kind of tucking up all the wires uh, that so you don't see anything and it looks clean. Um, I personally think it looks fine the way it is. Um, you also have access to adjust these Olin's uh, preload compression and rebound adjustments that you wouldn't normally have access to. So that's actually a really nice feature of this whole setup. Uh, really makes it a little bit easier for you to make those fine tune adjustments down the road. So this is pretty much ready to go. We've just got to button up uh, the fairing on the other side and get the fender and wheel and everything put back on and then uh, we'll see where we're at. And there it is. Our Electrolyte standard is all buttoned up and back together. We've got obviously our uh, new bars on, new risers with the pullback plate, fairing is back assembled with the windshield on, and down here, can't see it, uh, front wheel and fender are all back on. So this is gonna be the final product for how this setup is gonna look. So I'll come over here and kind of talk about what I mentioned before, which is the skirt that used to be here is no longer here. And obviously uh, the ignition switch is no longer in place either, but that's not a problem because like we did in the beginning, uh, we flashed our ECU, or I should say we flashed our BCM to disable that switch. So the power to the bike is now entirely controlled through the switch housing, which is great. So this is similar to how a CVO would function. Um, obviously the fork lock on a CVO is separate. Uh, so this bike does not have a fork lock anymore, um, but that's just one of the prices you have to pay if you want some of this uh, performance stuff, you sacrifice a little bit of convenience sometimes. So um, that's great. Down here, like I mentioned before, uh, our Olin's uh, cartridge caps are easily accessible that you can get to with a wrench to adjust preload, compression, rebound, all that stuff. Um, and then obviously down here, I mean, this still looks, in my opinion, pretty clean. I don't think you'd necessarily notice that there was a whole lot missing. Uh, and I personally kind of like that you get to see a little bit more of the function of the bike. Um, kind of one of the things that makes a Harley a Harley is that um, when you start pulling plastic covers off, things still look good underneath. It's not sort of, weird truss frame designs like a snowmobile with wheels. Uh, I might be mentioning a particular bike. You can figure that one, that out one on your own. Um, I'll show you, here's the, that valence we took off. Um, so basically this just goes on the shelf in case you ever wanna switch back. Um, these switches in this particular bike, there was nothing here. Um, an OE electric glide standard or an OE street glide is not gonna have any buttons here. If you wanted to do this on a bike that had some functionality here from the factory, like an ultra limited comes to mind, that's gonna have an auxiliary uh, light switch right here, you're gonna have to find another place to put that. Um, another option may be you could figure out a way to kind of hack this thing back together and put it back on, but uh, I really doubt if that's possible, to be honest with you. It's not like on the road glides where you're just simply making holes for the, the T-bars to come through. On this bike, really the meat of the middle right here is where uh, those T-bars come up through because of that pullback plate. So my guess is that this probably couldn't be reused, even if you tried to modify it. But if somebody wants to try it, uh, that'd be cool. So this is gonna do it for us on this one. Uh, the next thing is we're just gonna have to go out and ride this a little bit and make sure everything feels great. But I gotta say, I'm 100% confident that this is gonna be an awesome, awesome setup. Uh, the T-bars with the pullback are a really, really great change for a bagger. It really makes the bike ride a lot more like a dyno or a lighter bike. You really, really feel the difference in the lightness of the front end by getting that leverage point changed from those stock bars to the T-bars. So that's gonna do it for us on this one, like I said, and uh, stick around and hopefully we'll have some more stuff for you soon.